Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's been a busy week for me, but uh, there's been a lot going on and many of you have probably already heard that SpaceX successfully tested their Raptor engine on a prototype Starship hull. So last week they had been doing pressure tests. This was an image or video that was tweeted out by Elon showing it snowing in Texas. That's his quote. This is the fifth or the sixth Starship, depending upon how you count it. Uh, but it's the first one that's gone through enough of the testing and been installed with the thrust hardware so that they could actually fit engines on it and perform a static test. We did get this great picture from Elon showing underneath the thrust skirt on the Starship. Unlike the Starship hopper, the skirt comes all the way down and covers all of the nozzles. There's a single Raptor engine in there, but it's not quite in the middle because of course it's designed to be sitting in a cluster of three and the plumbing is going to be sat off center so that they can fit three in there. There's also six landing legs around the outside. And these are of course designed to flip out and support it when it lands after its short flight. This uh, SN4 was only supposed to do a short flight. The majority of the imagery coming out of this uh, operation is coming from a bunch of fans down there who have pointed cameras at it. So this is S Padre, and what you can see here on the side are the black COPVs, the pressure vessels that are going to be used to pressurize the propellant inside it. Now, Raptor is designed for something called autogenous pressurization, where the propellant is heated inside the engine, it turns to gas, and then it's injected back into the tanks to keep them pressurized. So these aren't supposed to be part of the final design, they're just bolted onto the outside to make sure that they can test their engine. Uh, the, another person that's been taking amazing imagery for everyone, and we really love her, is Boca Chica gal Mary down in uh, Boca Chica, obviously. Uh, and she was uh, basically the person that was kind of running all the cameras for the NASA Spaceflight.com stream. And I joined that earlier in the week, and I was very happy to sit and watch the tank get cold, frosty, watch some gas burp out of the bottom in what was presumed to be a test where they spun up the turbines on the pumps. I unfortunately managed to miss the first uh, test firing of a Raptor engine on a Starship hull. This was Tuesday night. You could see them getting ready and boom, there you go. Full flow stage combustion cycle. It probably only fired for a couple of seconds, but during that time it would have burned over a ton of propellant. And I do strongly suggest you go and check out NASA Spaceflight's actual live stream so you can hear the fans reacting like crazed sports fans. Um, it's always fun. Now, the next day, we had another test, and unfortunately, NASA spaceflight cameras were broken, so it was missed. Everyday astronaut, of course, was also on scene working with S. Padre and got a completely different angle. And again, you know, I gotta give huge amounts of respect to people that are down there taking all these videos and imagery. I mean, I like to think that my armchair analysis sometimes adds something that uh, isn't captured in the images, but without those images, we would be speculating in a vacuum. So absolute respect to everybody that's down there that's covering this, to NASA spaceflight, Boca Chica Mary, Everyday Astronaut, Espadre. Yeah, seriously, love those people. So that's obviously a big step forward for SpaceX's Starship program, but they're going to have to keep delivering on these steps forward if they're going to keep, well, if they're going to make NASA happy and be seriously considered as a human landing system contender. After these tests, the engine was removed and has been placed elsewhere. So we're not sure if there's uh, they're going to do further testing on the tank, if the engine needs to be inspected further before they're going to fly it. I think that's very likely. Hopefully the engine wasn't damaged because that will delay things. We did find out that it was engine number 18, which uh, of course puts another data point on the production rate of Raptor engines. While this was all happening, musician and artist Grimes had her child. What's this got to do with SpaceX? Well, if you don't know, Elon Musk is the father. So congratulations to everyone involved on a successful payload delivery. And if you think this isn't spacey enough, wait till you see what the name is. Zia 12. What? Okay. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I think these two were made for each other. The explanation that Grimes offers for the name is fascinating and indeed led to many, many clicks on my video about the A12 ox cart. 
And I, of course, can vibe with that. I've got a son named Orion after a mythical uh, Titan or a constellation or even a nuclear bomb powered starship. And you might dismiss that as some sort of crazy nerd name, that he might have problems at school. No, he went into first grade and he was the second Orion in that class. Maybe that's just because I live in California. Anyway, California, also home to Hollywood, and the news is that Tom Cruise is planning on filming a movie on the space station in collaboration with SpaceX. I presume the collaboration that SpaceX will offer will be to deliver the uh, star and their support staff to the space station. Now, I was initially sceptical. I mean, sure, Tom Cruise loves to do his own stunts and he'd fly to the space station, but I thought the whole thing would be too ridiculously expensive. But then, later in the week, both Jim Bridenstine and Elon Musk confirmed that this was legit. Last year, NASA finalized the cost structure for private individuals that wanted to use the space station. It works out to be just over $35,000 per day per person. But that probably compares favorably to Tom Cruise's going rate. The real cost, however, will be in delivering the stars and the film crew to the space station. Uh, your Space Adventures is talking about $200 million to send four people to space. I think SpaceX's price will be a bit lower, but all the same, that's the budget of a pretty serious movie. And the ISS doesn't exactly offer a huge amount of space to film in. What it does offer, however, is amazing views. I mean, whatever they do, it's still going to be cheaper to do it with, you know, visual effects. But, you know, Tom Cruise loves to do his own stunts. I'm sure it's definitely a marketing hook that puts, uh, talks about it being a film filmed in space. And, hey, the worst that happens is they actually get to hang around real astronauts and scientists who actually fix their scripts. And, of course, it's not the first movie that's filmed in space. It's the first fictional work filmed in space, I guess. Back when the space station started, they actually launched an IMAX camera with the crews, and that was turned into a documentary in 2002, narrated by Tom Cruise. And finally, an update on the Chinese launch from earlier in the week. The spacecraft spent a few days in orbit. First of all, their inflatable heat shield experiment, which apparently goes back a few years now, um, well... It apparently landed the next day and failed to be successful, whatever that means. Some sources say that it flipped over on descent. But uh, yeah, regardless, it was supposed to land without any parachute or anything. But of course, the whole capsule was up, you know, loaded up with whatever experiments they could find. For example, they included a bunch of seeds since they were going to be flying through the Van Allen belts. And in fact, this mission would fly through the Van Allen belt several times because they took several orbits to get up to their target orbit. There was also a 3D printer that was on board being tested. NASA, of course, has its own 3D printer on the International Space Station. Space-based fabrication is really a big deal because if you can just upload you know, designs for a part and have it printed, that saves a lot of problems given how long it takes to get stuff up to space. And hey, you know, could you imagine how different Apollo 13 would have been if they could have just 3D printed an adapter for their carbon dioxide scrubbers? So yeah, the capsule that was going to be doing the landing, it flew for three days in space, slowly raising its orbit to an apogee of about 8,000 kilometers. Apparently, they also said that it was going to do a skip re-entry, which is something Apollo did. That's where it skips down deeper into the atmosphere and then rises back up using aerodynamics of the capsule. And this spreads out the thermal load over a longer period of time and means that your heat shield can be different, better. I don't know. It, there's many things you can optimize for in re-entries. So yeah, uh, this is the footage we have. It's all SD quality. The heat shield, of course, is detachable and you get to see it pop off. There it goes, it falls onto the surface. The capsule's using three parachutes for redundancy, although unlike, say, SpaceX parachutes, they're all the same. There's no pattern coding to let you know which one's which. But as I said, it'll be years before this flies. People, they'll be using the Shenzhou for a good amount of time to come. On the landing, you can see, well, I mean, it is definitely bearing quite a resemblance to the classic Dragon 1 capsule. Although, to be fair, the laws of physics kind of constrain what you can do in terms of capsule design and aerodynamic stability. I also saw confirmation that the service module was apparently much closer to the Apollo module. Some sources claimed that it had hydrogen oxygen fuel cells on it, which is interesting because it also has solar panels as well. Anyway, that's the sort of roundup of everything that happened in the last three days. I've got to get back to work. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.